All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Julie Creech, and I'll be your moderator today for today's installment of the AMSSM National Fellows Online Education Committee uh, Lecture Series. Tonight, we're going to learn about altitude and dive medicine from Lieutenant Colonel Chad Holsepple. But before we get started, I just would like to kind of go over the objectives of this evening's presentation as well as some ground rules. So as you know, this lecture series is uh, serves a purpose to help adjunct your current education through your fellowship, as well as introduce fellows to our guest speakers um, and help prepare you for additional CAQ prep. For our basic ground rules, we do ask that you mute your microphone and turn off your video during the presentation. Should you have any questions that you would like to ask the speaker, please go ahead and send those to me through the chat function and I'll ask them um, to the speaker at the end of this presentation. Um, and then otherwise, uh, sit back and enjoy. But before I turn it over to Chad Hulsevel, I'd like to give him a brief introduction that does certainly not do him justice. But Lieutenant Colonel Chad Hulsevel is the director for the National Capital Consortium Sports Medicine Fellowship Program and a faculty member in the Department of Family Medicine at the Uniform Services University Health Sciences. He has served multiple roles in the Department of Defense as a military team physician and today serves as a key leader in sports medicine across the entire DOD. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Chad um, as he teaches us about altitude and dive medicine. Thank you, Julie. And you can hear me well and see the slides. Everything looks great. All right, thank you, Julie. I uh, just appreciate the kind introduction and inviting me here to speak this evening. Uh, welcome all the AMSSM members that I see on here. A lot of familiar names and audience, many of which probably could uh, give this lecture as well. But I do hope to provide some insights on two topics, as Julie said, altitude and dive medicine. We'll try to keep these as brief as possible, um, but there is a large breadth um, of information on these topics themselves. So these are just uh, our disclosures. I have nothing to disclose for this uh, talk. And educational objectives, um, just uh, leading on to what Julie said as well. Big things that we're gonna talk about tonight uh, is really getting a common understanding of uh, dive injuries themselves. We're gonna talk about many different types of dive injuries and the various different laws that uh, you know we need to understand to understand these uh, dive injuries themselves. And then we're going to flip and we're going to start to talk about uh, high altitude illness. And I think these go hand in hand. And that's why um, Julie wanted to put these together. And I think this will be a great talk. So specific discussion points that we'll talk in dive medicine. I think we have to understand the physics and the physiology of diving uh, to, be able to, to be able to understand the dive injuries and how we treat these conditions. Again, we're going to talk about multiple different, uh, whether it be barotrauma or decompression illness, and we'll break down decompression illness and to the multiple entities that fall underneath that. Um, and then management, uh, just the initial management of our divers, and then a little discussion about the divers alert network and what is available. There are multiple topics we could include in dive injuries. If you're interested in dive medicine, I would encourage you to uh, explore these other areas as well. There's many different injuries that can happen to divers. Tonight, we're gonna uh, relate this conversation specifically to uh, dive injuries themselves that happen during the dive. Um, and most of them, again, are related to those pressures, not to the marine life or the cold water situations, drowning or trauma. I think the first thing when we start to talk about whether it be high altitude illness, or we whether we talk about dive medicine themselves. If we're the medical officer on site, I would encourage us all as we do for our team medicine, whether that be a high school, a collegiate level, a professional team, uh, we plan and we practice those plans and we communicate with those individuals <clears throat> in which are a part of those plans. And so I would encourage you all, if you are uh, involved in some type of austere wilderness medicine, that's the type of format that you continue to utilize, whether you're on the field side or whether you're in the austere environment. And I think educate those around you, um, because again, uh, you need multiple hands in most situations and educate them to identify specific types of injuries. They can assist in that treatment or care um, as you go throughout those protocols. 
if possible, as we do with other uh, of our team medicine or our team sports, uh, pre-participation physicals, I think, can help at least assess your team uh, before you would go on these high adventure type activities. Most often, in my experience, unless you're in a military situation, this is very difficult to be able to do prior to an event. I include travel insurance here, I think as physicians uh, to help advise our patients about travel insurance. If we look at, uh, especially international medicine, uh, have them at least call their insurance company, uh, be able to evaluate what their insurance coverage will and will not do, especially in the international environment. That'll be key um, and then help them understand potentially the benefits of having a travel insurance Cases like a evacuation, uh, whether it be Mount Everest or other remote areas can cost in the upwards of 60, 70, $80,000. And that's difficult to assume a bill like that, um, especially without any type of insurance. Other things, know your medications, know what you can or cannot carry, um, especially if in international countries, uh, what you're allowed to carry. If you're uh, unfamiliar with those areas, a starting point that you could look at would be contacting the embassy. There's usually an embassy nurse. Um, they can assist with local regulations or policies. Uh, so you want to reach out um, maybe to those individuals that have been there before as well. And that way you're carrying the medications that are legal um, that you can use within that country if you decide to carry medications with you. I think the last piece is probably one of the biggest pieces is know your role. Um, because we tend to, as physicians, especially sports medicine physicians, we want to get involved in the activity. I think it's key to know your role in these situations is that you're there as a medical officer. You're not there to be on the dive itself. If you're on the dive, you're not going to be able to identify uh, emergencies if they come to the surface and you're not there. Um, and so you're focus and you have a narrow focus on the dive itself and your safety uh, while you're on the dive. And so I'd encourage you as a medical officer, you have to be a step back, just like you're on the sideline with any team. Uh, you have to step back and you have to assess the situation. If you're involved in the situation, you're not gonna be able to see all that's going on. So as we look at this, um, this is kind of a typical dive pattern. There's multiple ones. I'm not saying this is the only one uh, as far as a dive, but when you go to plan that dive, uh, the first part of that dive is that controlled descent. And the, the important part about this is we start to talk about barotrauma here in a second, is that clearing of the eustachian tubes as you start to dis slowly descend. And then as we look at bottom time, and then as you come up. So in the ascent, uh, it's common to you know, ascend about 30 feet per minute. Uh, so one foot every two seconds, and that'll help with a slow ascent. And that's key when you start to look at pulmonary barotrauma or you're looking at some of the DCS, DCI type injuries that we'll talk about later on the top. A safety stop, very common in recreational diving uh, to have a safety stop right at the three to five minute, uh, right at the 15 feet mark, uh, which is usually three to five minutes long. Uh, some experts advise that you should have a longer uh, stop, 10 to 15 minutes. Of course, this is based on your dive, uh, the number of dives you've done, uh, many factors go into uh, how you assess this, but I would encourage your patients uh, to always consider a safety stop because this is where they can off gas when we start to talk about the various different injuries that can happen. When I first started diving, uh, it was uh, said that we should have a negative buoyancy as you start to ascend. Um, and now uh, they really encourage to have a neutral buoyancy. So you're not trying to kick as you go up uh, to the surface. And why have they um, encouraged individuals to have that neutral buoyancy is because they found that divers, when they have that negative buoyancy, they'll end up holding their breath on the way up. And we'll talk about um, AGE uh, that will, can be caused because of barotrauma on the way up. And so this is key uh, to advise those individuals in which they're diving to maintain that neutral buoyancy in the water and not have that negative buoyancy where they're kicking to the surface. So epidemiology, when we look at cases, uh, scuba diving, recreational scuba diving, we're not talking about military, we're not talking about commercial diving, uh, continues to increase not only in the United States, but worldwide. There's a significant increase in the last probably 10 to 20 years or so. And you can see the median age and the participant's gender. 
if you're in these five top states, uh, we're in the Maryland, Virginia, DC area. Uh, surprisingly, there's a number of divers, probably uh, they go to remote locations. It's not a great diving environment off the coast here, but uh, there's multiple different environments. If you're in those areas, uh, you probably are more likely to see divers and take care of divers uh, in your office. And potentially if you're into doing some type of austere wilderness medicine, be out on the dive side as well. So again, looking a little further into uh, what we see is uh, most common for patients. So most commonly patients present uh, with barotrauma to the emergency department uh, from diving related injuries. Specifically in most cases, it's ear barotrauma is one of the most common. Um, why do we need to know this? I think it's really one to identify the subgroups um, that are risk of injury or death when we're advising our patients. Also back to that travel insurance, being able to advise our patients uh, on the risk uh, of potentially having some type of injury while uh, traveling internationally or outside their insurance coverage and being able to advise them on that. If you look at the incidence of death, overall it's fairly low. Um, if we uh, use MBAs as a comparison, there's a lot about 11 deaths per 100,000 people annually in the United States. So overall, this is a fairly low death rate uh, for diving. So as we come to the first law, and so again, like I said in the beginning, I think it's key to understand uh, the laws. And the reason why is it helps us understand a little bit more of the physiology and the treatment of these patients. So the first law that we're going to talk about is Boyle's Law, um, and it really is talking about the gas compression at depth. And what we see is volume is inversely proportional to pressure. The main gases uh, in recreational diving um, are nitrogen and oxygen. Unlike our altitude, in which we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, the partial pressure is increased with descent, uh, loading the tissues or on gassing, um, and the partial pressure of nitrogen and oxygen actually increase as we dive. So on the surface, uh, nitrogen is 0.79, um, and oxygen is 0 0.21. And as we get to 33 feet of seawater, we can see that there's a rapid increase over a 50% increase uh, and at that atmospheric pressure uh, goes from one to two. And what we'll see is the partial pressure of nitrogen goes up to 1.58. Uh, and oxygen doubles as well to 0.42. And as we discuss this a little bit more, why is that become important? Is because of course your volume of your gases becomes smaller. Also that increased uh, pressure, that atmospheric pressure causes on gassing um, and on gassing becomes and off gassing becomes a, a key part in understanding uh, the injuries uh, during diving. So the first thing we're going to look at, um, this is a demonstration that I give annually every year to our fellows. I think it helps to understand, uh, one, how much pressure uh, that it requires to, you know, shrink the size of this. So there's a lot of pressure as we go down to depth. That, again, helps you understand uh, barrow trauma at depth. Uh, the other thing that it describes is that shrinking in that volume or size for Boyle's Law. So um, no further comments for that, but you'll see on the left side, um, as I depress that 50 cc uh, syringe, you can see the reduction in that size from one atmosphere to two atmospheres. Uh, there's a balloon in that syringe and you can see that compression. Um, obviously I didn't do my hand workouts before this because as you get down to about three, um, that causes a significant uh, decrease uh, in the volume and also a lot of increase in the pressure that you have to apply to that. So again, thinking about Boyle's Law, inversely uh, proportional to the pressure. And so we're increasing that partial pressure and we're loading uh, that nitrogen into the tissues and the cellular structures as we dive. So barotrauma. So as we think about barotrauma, it really comes down to that pressure and volume. So we have to go back to our Boyle's Law. So the areas of barotrauma we're going to talk about, um, specifically, we're going to talk through ear, sinus, mask, lungs. Um, additional spaces that you really need to think about. GI, rarely you have any issues um, that your patient suffers any issues from barotrauma because the GI tract itself is easily distensible and easily compressible by design. Dry suits are outside this conversation. Dry suits is a technical diving um, and requires additional certification to be able to do dry suits. 
there are issues that can occur with barotrauma because of the dry suit, but again, that's outside this conversation. So let's talk about ear barotrauma. Again, most common diving injury that occurs uh, on descent. And really what happens uh, in these cases is there's um, the eustachian tube dysfunction or inflammation because of upper respiratory tract infections, uh, seasonal allergies, and the pressure in the tympanic membrane is lower than the pressure of the surrounding tissue. This imbalance in the pressures themselves causes a vacuum and the vacuum in that middle ear will slowly cause that ear to swell. It'll cause the eardrum to bulge inwards. Um, and then a slow leakage of fluid, which ends up uh, with bleeding and ruptured vessels. What can we do? Uh, we'll talk throughout the talk. What can we uh, advise our, our patients about that are divers? They need to regularly equalize uh, their ears and their sinuses by squeezing their nose and gently blowing in, into this um, mast itself. And like I said, it's gently, uh, and we're not overdoing this as we go. And why are these caused? It's because of inadequate uh, equalization and sometimes overzealous, especially common and in initial divers, first time divers uh, will be overzealous with the equalization. And both of those can result in barotrauma to the area itself. So moving from uh, ear barotrauma to sinus barotrauma, again, very common, same mechanism that we really see uh, with ear barotrauma is our divers typically are, you know, that have this occur are those divers that, uh, first time divers are those divers that are uh, diving one with some type of upper respiratory tract infection, uh, common cold, and this allows them not to equalize as well as other divers. And so again, uh, how do you treat this or how can they prevent this with diving is equalizing slowly as they descend. Um, you can see down there on the bottom, uh, nasal perforations. The most common way that you'll see these present uh, to a dive medical officer is the individual with epistaxis. So that's how you're gonna be uh, clued off that this individual likely has some type of sinus barotrauma. So kind of summarize overall the treatment, uh, very similar for ear and sinus. I won't repeat it again, but equalizing is important. If they can't equalize and they need to ascend and try to equalize, if they still can't, they need to abort the dive. Post-dive, very common treatments just for either allergies or upper respiratory tract infections. The prophylactic antibiotic therapy is still controversial. Obviously, if there's a, if you, um, you see or assess that they do have an infection, then um, you feel that requires a treatment, then again, uh, that would not usually occur in the acute phases of a uh, ear barotrauma. Uh, the last piece that we need to consider is, is if there's middle ear barotrauma, is there inner ear barotrauma? So we need to do a good job at assessing, does this patient have any vertigo, nystagmus, hearing loss that might be more suggestive of that? Um, either case, if we have a tympanic membrane rupture or a nasal perforation um, or some type of uh, potential inner ear uh, dysfunction, consider referring to a specialist, an ENT physician, uh, for further evaluation to ensure there's not something secondarily going on. Mask squeeze, I know this picture looks pretty scary, uh, especially if you see them on the surface. Uh, there, to mask squeeze itself, there's no long-term sequelae. Uh, mask squeeze is caused, again, it's all like putting suction cups uh, on your eyes uh, when you dive with a mask on. If they don't equalize the mass with diving, just like equalizing their ears uh, on descent, then this will result in the mass squeeze itself. Treatment is pretty simple for this, no diving uh, while they're, they're swollen or symptomatic, and they may return to diving uh, with resolution of the periorbital swelling. Now moving into more severe conditions, um, as we start to talk about uh, you know, potential death uh, with these types of conditions. So pulmonary barotrauma itself, we talked a little bit about it initially, but um, it's slightly different than other forms of barotrauma because the other forms of barotrauma we just talked about happens on the descent. Um, this happens on the ascent um, and it happens with depressurization. What typically is the case uh, with these is, is that um, an individual suddenly goes to the surface uh, and it'll cause a sudden increase or expansion 
um, in the air volume. Um, and with that increase, that sudden increase in the air volume can cause alveoli rupture, which leads to pneumothorax or mediastinal emphysema. And we'll talk about AGE here in a little bit, but it can also lead to AGE. Uh, there are some increased risk. Uh, there's a possible uh, association with asthma. I would say that connection um, is only a slight connection. Most of the studies are smaller studies on that. And COPD, uh, there is a connection with uh, increased risk for individuals with COPD. So changing gears a little bit. So we've talked about barotrauma and our pressure and Boyle's law. We can't forget about Boyle's law as we go into talking about decompression illness, but we're going to add Henry's law uh, to our discussion now. So decompression illness, I love this. Um, this is a great illustration. This illustration really wraps up, and I'll have a couple at the end that really tie everything in together. But this demonstrates everything that we're going to talk about um, throughout the decompression illness. So it's all about the bubbles, like the, the title says itself. So Henry's law really tells us that gases like nitrogen, oxygen, again, uh, recreational diving, those are the two most common gases that are in air. Um, there's not additional helium or other, such as nitrox or some other technical diving. And Henry's law tells us that they increase solubility uh, in the blood. And unlike oxygen, whereas we look at nitrogen, Oxygen is metabolized um, by our cellular structures, and nitrogen, if you're di diving on helium as well, will tend to build up in the body. And so when the divers want to emerge from the water, so when they um, ascend uh, into uh, the water, into the surface itself, uh, they want to make sure they do so slowly, as we discussed before. If they do it quickly, then that those gases will suddenly come out of solution and they'll go into the blood itself. And that's where we get issues uh, with the decompression illnesses. So our divers are trained to go up slowly and gradually, and that, that way they're able to clear uh, nitrogen specifically in the case of recreational diving um, in real time. And this allows them uh, not to experience the next uh, video that we'll see, which I call the soda bottle uh, phenomenon where we see everything bubble, bubble out of solution. So here's a video that I taped. See uh, with opening uh, a soda bottle, what we can see with that is, is that with this bottle, if we think about nitrogen in this case, I know it's uh, CO2, but nitrogen in this case, uh, that's pressurized within the bottle. Um, as we open that bottle or ascend uh, to the surface as a diver would, that those bubbles, that nitrogen bubbles out of solution, so it's off-gassing. Um, and when that individual, um, you know, that dives suddenly decreases that ambient pressure, then they get that off-gassing, which causes some of the decompression illnesses. I didn't really have a better place to put this in um, because this is part of Henry's law as well. And you should recognize this if you're a dive medical officer or somebody that's counseling, somebody that's diving. Um, generally with recreational diving, uh, the depths uh, for recreational diving, depending on the training agency, can be anywhere between 30 to 40 meters, uh, 100 to 130 feet. Uh, beyond that, uh, there's a variety of safety issues that happen with oxygen toxicity, uh, nitrogen narcosis, like we see here on this slide, uh, that significantly increases the risk um, while recreational diving. Um, as you can see on the right, there's a slide here. All gases really have some potential to have narcosis to that. Helium is one of those that um, they haven't experienced that with diving, and that's why some of the technical divers will use helium uh, to go to extreme depths. Uh, but nitrogen, you can see on the slide itself, uh, this is one of the most common causes of nitrogen narcosis at depth. And with that, uh, what's the problem is, is that our patients uh, have altered consciousness, therefore potentially increasing the risk of them having some type of diving injury because they're not aware of their surroundings or their depth while diving. So moving from nitrogen narcosis, we're gonna talk about first arterial bubbles. And specifically when we talk about arterial bubbles, we're gonna talk about arterial gas embolism. So AGE, like I've mentioned before. 
So AGE is a severe decompression illness. Uh, it's as a result of that sudden rapid ascent. Uh, and it's due because the decrease in the atmospheric pressure allows gases, specifically nitrogen, to come out of solution. And that increases the volume um, as they suddenly rise to the surface. And a couple things that this can lead to, one of those things is the alveoli rupture um, as that gas expands within the alveoli uh, due to that barotrauma. And because of the rupture of the alveoli, the gas can migrate from the venous uh, to the arterial circulation. Another cause of AGE is the pre-existing right to left shunts of VSDs, ASDs, and PFOs, um, which also can lead to AGE. You can see here on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, these typically are injuries that happen suddenly, and you see an individual that suddenly surfaces, and within a short amount of time, they'll start to have symptoms. So how do we treat it? Um, you know, if you're looking at a simulation case and uh, you put this in front of whether it be residents or fellows or otherwise, um, they might think or go right to assessing this individual for the administration of TBA. Uh, given that the individual, they're thinking that it's going down the, the stroke route. Unfortunately, TPA does not work uh, for breaking down these air bubbles that have come out of solution. And so the primary, absolutely number one treatment for this is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. In route to hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, you can utilize administration of 100% oxygen by non-rebreather, uh, consider IV fluids as well but these are only temporary relief of symptoms. The absolute number one treatment uh, for arterial gas embolus is to get them to a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. So speaking of chambers, um, so uh, the United States Naval Decompression Treatment Table 6, uh, this is commonly used around the world to, be, uh, to treat decompression illnesses. The, there's approximate four and a half hours uh, bottom time here that you can see um, and this is treatment time at depth. And as you look at that treatment time at depth and why these are done specifically in centers is because of the amount of time and oxygen that is required uh, for these treatments that allows the off-gassing of nitrogen specifically in our recreational cases. And so this is a very common treatment table that the chamber you're seeing on the right is actually for equipment, um, but this is something that you know, typically is done in a multi-place chamber so that you have the ability to be able to check on your place, um, your, your patient themselves control airways or control other types of equipment that you're monitoring with them. Um, other types of chambers, you're not able to monitor them quite as well um, because there can only be uh, one individual within the unique place chambers. So we're switching from arterial bubbles to venous bubbles. And we're gonna talk about uh, decompression sickness. So a part of decompression illness is decompression sickness. And this brings up again, uh, that soda pop phenomenon that we're talking about, that individual that uh, rapidly ascended to the surface and had the gas come out of solution too quickly, uh, whether it be to the lungs or other tissues such as uh, the brain. And two types of decompression sicknesses can, can arise with this. Uh, type two is generally, obviously you can see the symptoms uh, more severe. Uh, there is some recent debate, uh, whether uh, in the diving community itself uh, regarding type one, there is a question to whether uh, there's a subset of type one patients who do not require uh, hyperbaric oxygen treatment and can be managed with oxygen observation. I would tell you this is highly controversial. Uh, the decision should be made by a hyperbaric physician. Uh, in the emergency room, if you're seeing these uh, or you're on the dive side, uh, again, going back to what we've talked about before, the number one treatment is to get them to a hyperbaric chamber. Really the differentiation from type one to type two, I can tell you type one, um, there's uh, the skin symptoms, which you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, but most commonly presents uh, with pain, pain in the joints or pain in the tissue themselves. And when you're looking at type two, this is the, obviously the more severe type. You're looking at those areas that, uh, or organs that are more highly supplied uh, by blood, which would be more susceptible to um, those, those gases causing infiltration of those tissues. 
And back to what we talked about before, this is a training operation that's going down, on down at the Naval Experimental Diving Unit. And these are the cases in which you wanna have your team together, your team assembled, and everybody knows their roles because these are the cases that you wanna be on top of right away uh, to be able to assess that patient and then move them to that definitive care. So looking at decompression sickness, um, takeaways from these two charts are the various symptoms that occur most frequently with decompression uh, sickness and the timelines in which they occur. And so why do I bring this up is if, you're, if you have high suspicion of DCS, you should transport your patient immediately to a facility that has a hyperbaric chamber and physicians that can be aware of the you know, symptoms that might be occurring and get them into a hyperbaric chamber as soon as possible. These are cases that you don't wanna wait on and you don't wanna hold them on the dive side and then they start having symptoms. On the right-hand side, you can see the timeline. This will come up in a little bit when we talk about um, from diving to flying. And this is why uh, there's recommendations for various different timing uh, between diving and flying. So again, decompression sickness, uh, just like we talked about with AGE, uh, hyperbaric oxygen is the definitive uh, treatment, administration of 100% O2 by non-rebreather and IV fluids can provide some temporary relief, but that is not the definitive treatment. And back to our initial slide for diving protocols, there's multiple different diving protocols out there, but again, uh, with recreational divers, uh, a safety stop is key, uh, and why the safety stop, as you guys now uh, understand or already knew, uh, is because of that off-gassing and the ability to allow them to slowly off-gas, especially nitrogen and, and recreational diving, to avoid, potentially avoid, any type of uh, decompression illnesses. So DCI is not only in divers. Um, if you're taking care of other individuals, if you're in the military and you're taking care of high altitude U2 type pilots, um, they can also have DCI. Astronauts are another example. Uh, I would also um, caution those individuals. A common area uh, for tourists to go over to is Kilimanjaro and they will rapidly ascend to the peak um, about 5,500 meters, 18,000 feet. And this can also cause uh, decompression illness with that rapid ascent. Um, and again, it's just awareness and making your parent, patients aware. There is a slight increased uh, risk of DC, DCI at lower altitudes if there was a recent dive. So moving from talking about our, our arterial bubbles, and then we're gonna talk specifically about cases that you uh, might be involved in or might be involved in in the clinic themselves. So the first one I already mentioned, uh, so diving and flying. Again, these are recommendations. I would always check if you, uh, you don't uh, have a background in diving um, with the Divers Alert Network. If you're not familiar with how quickly they also, when individuals dive, um, the charts will give them recommendations on when they should go from diving to flying. But all these recommendations are based on they do not have DCS symptoms, and they also are flying in an aircraft that the aircraft itself is pressurized from two to 8,000 feet. And this is a common pressurization uh, in both military and civilian aircraft. It's just the awareness of that if they're planning on doing something um, other than those two types of aircraft uh, where they're, they're doing some type of you know, uh, free fall type of activity that could become uh, a concern for them. So on a single day dive with no decompression, no decompression is that 33 feet or less, um, 12 plus hours dive to fly. If they're doing multiple dives or multiple day dives um, with no decompression dives, less than 33 feet, uh, 18 plus hours. And then if there's any type of decompression dive, you know, that's greater than 33 feet is 24 plus hours uh, from dive to fly. And that goes back to that chart of when DCS symptoms occur. So looking at coronary arteries uh, disease, so cardiac arrest is the second most common death uh, while recreational diving. This is only surpassed by drowning. And so why does this occur? Scuba diving causes increased strain on the heart. Uh, it's estimated that uh, in tepid water, not cold water, 
that at a one knot current, which is a very, very low current uh, while diving, that the individual will exert about eight mets. And physiologically, what's behind this is, is uh, there's decreased heart rate, increased vagal tone due to the dive reflex. A lot of times this is blunted because they have a mask on. Uh, other things that will occur is increased interthoracic uh, blood volume due to the increased pressure, atmospheric pressure as they dive, which increases the blood volume, which increases the CDP and cardiac output. You can see the recommendations uh, over to the left of pre-dive assessments for those greater than uh, 40 with no known cardiac event uh, or those individuals with multiple risk factors, those individuals with a history of prior cardiac event. My recommendation, uh, if you have an individual like this, would be reaching out, consulting with a cardiologist for these cases. So uh, PFO, we talked earlier about PFO when we talked about AGE, but with a PFO, we have the right to left shunt in the heart. Uh, theoretically, this increases the risk of DC DCS by creating a pathway for the nitrogen bubbles uh, to enter the systemic circulation while bypassing the lungs. In general, uh, it is not recommended uh, to specifically screen our divers uh, for a PFO. The recommendation is uh, for individuals with a PFO, with a known PFO, um, is that they can dive if they can tolerate exercise. Um, there's a strong recommendation that they maintain a no decompression dive. That's a dive that's less than 33 feet. Again, in cases like this, I would recommend that you consult with a cardiologist and have them see a cardiologist before they go out and uh, experience an issue while diving. Another case is asthma. So this commonly comes up. There's no increased uh, relative risk of DCS, barotrauma, or death uh, with those individuals with asthma. You can see the pre-evaluation uh, for diving uh, recommendations for testing prior to diving. Uh, those cases that it's not recommended uh, for diving are scenarios where they're using the rescue medications within 48 hours of diving. Also, those individuals that have um, asthma that, are, is, that is triggered by exercise or emotionally triggered and cold-induced asthmatics. I would highly recommend in your asthma cases that you consult with a pulmonologist for those cases. And diabetes is gonna be our last special case uh, with our diabetic patients. They can die with stable on their treatment plan, which varies uh, depending on the length of time that they have to be stable based on their oral versus injectable treatments. Uh, they also should not have any secondary complications such as diabetic retinopathy, which could complicate their diving. So as a reference where you could reach out uh, for any help, uh, the Divers Alert Network is a great uh, place to reach out. Again, you can reach them uh, locally here within the United States, internationally. They have multiple chambers um, that they can refer you to. They also have specialists uh, that can assist with questions. The bottom one is the Naval Experimental Diving Unit. Uh, they also uh, have individuals that are on call. Uh, for those that are civilians, I would recommend going to the DAN and the Divers Alert Network. So in summary for our diving cases, uh, our dive cases, what I want you to remember are those, that barotrauma, that Boyle's Law, the bubbles that happen with DCI, uh, more of that Henry's Law. If in doubt, um, oxygenate them and get them to a chamber as soon as possible. The chamber is the treatment of choice uh, for these cases. And again, if you're dealing with anybody else that uh, is outside the diving realm, it does happen uh, to those individuals that are not just divers. This is an article with a great chart. Um, I think this breaks down everything that we talked about. On the left side, you're seeing the decompression illnesses, which breaks down into two areas that we just talked about with the type one, type two decompression sicknesses, the bins as they call it, uh, arterial gas embolism, that can uh, you know, come from the barotrauma that we see. Uh, remember, pulmonary barotrauma happens on the ascent. Uh, the rest of the barotrauma that we're seeing, whether it be ears, sinuses, uh, that's happening on the descent. And again, this is a great illustration uh, that's in the paper. Um, I think this is a great way to explain uh, how multiple DCS or AG happens in our body. 
So as I said, this is uh, not a sprint, uh, it's a marathon. Uh, and we're gonna go from talking in uh, altitude medicine or from dive medicine to now talking about altitude medicine. Please don't forget uh, all those uh, principles and laws that we discussed because they're exact same just in reverse uh, when we start to talk about altitude medicine. So I do wanna highlight a couple things here. So we're gonna recognize those high altitude illnesses and I, kinda, I got a couple different ways that hopefully helps you with those. Um, and the other thing I do wanna highlight is, is um, I use the word prophylactic rather than prevention in my talks. The reason why um, is, is preventative treatment typically renders a process impossible, uh, whereas more of prophylactic guards against the development of a condition or a disease. I think this is a key takeaway when we're counseling our patients so they understand that they are still at risk uh, for high altitude illnesses despite some of the interventions in which we might do as a prophylactic measure. These are the three areas in particular that we'll discuss. And then we're gonna go back to epidemiology. Again, I think this is important to have an understanding. Uh, most commonly, uh, we're gonna see AMS cases and we're gonna break those down here in just a second. And then the second uh, incidence of haste and hape, there's a, only a few cases that are seen of haste and hape and we'll break down uh, how those happen. Big risk factors, again, going back to counseling our patients uh, is those patients that um, have that rapid ascent. Again, we talked about the ascent and diving. The same occurs when we're ascending rapidly. Example, that Kilimanjaro, when we ascended rapidly in that case. Um, so watch for those cases or counsel your patients about that. Anyone that has a history of high altitude illnesses um, and other things that we got to consider again is obesity and coronary heart disease. This is a great illustration. It describes uh, various different mountain ranges uh, throughout the world. Also, um, we're talking about the various different pressures and uh, currents at different meters that we'll see of the different conditions. So 25% uh, of, of the population at 2,500 meters will have acute mountain sickness, AMS. The development of high altitude illnesses is not because there's less oxygen in altitude, FiO2, uh, remains the same at 21%. Think about the Boyle's Law that we just talked about with the reverse of diving. The problem is, is the hypobaric hypoxia due to the decrease in atmospheric pressure. This results in the decreased partial pressure of oxygen um, at the alveoli themselves. And so what do we see at high altitude? We see decreased exercise tolerance, increased ventilation at rest. At the very, very high altitude mark, we see O2 sats less than 90%. Uh, and the PO2 is less than 60. Extreme altitudes is, uh, you'll see the hypoxia and hypocapnia. And there are cases where individuals use pressurized oxygen at those levels, but again, commonly at those levels, you'll see hypoxia and hypocapnia. So first thing is, is we're gonna identify the high altitude illnesses. So St. Patty's Day is coming up. I think this is a great way to remember acute mountain sickness. So it's caused by the reduced partial pressure of oxygen at the alveoli decreasing, uh, developing tissue hypoxia. Uh, the brain is the is highest level, requires the highest level of oxygen, and it's the most sensitive to hypoxia and oxygen stress. Also, when we go up at altitude, there's high altitude periodic breathing. Uh, while sleeping at altitudes of 6,000 feet and greater. And this is also thought to be a contributing factor. And so as you look at our acute mountain sickness, it's that you know, individual that drank too much alcohol, um, that's an you know, analogy that we can utilize, and they have a headache, but they also have one of the other of the falling uh, along with that. When we advance to a more severe condition, high altitude cerebral edema, we move from the acute mountain sickness that we just talked about, so we do have all those symptoms, and then we start to have high altitude cerebral edema, which causes ataxia or change in the middle cells. They can have both, um, but they just need one or the other uh, to say that they have high altitude cerebral edema. This following video is gonna show us an individual with uh, high altitude cerebral edema.
We just put up the tent in this intense snowstorm. Yeah. Well, windstorm, I should say. Yeah, that's bomber, dude. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Here we go, look. Really 5,969 meters. And for those of you who that means nothing to, which, which is pretty much which all is of us, <laughs> 19,583 feet above sea level. Yes! Yes! So uh, tomorrow we go up to 22,000. What's the exact number? Tonight. I gotta get some food. I'm starving. And I think I have one more Snickers bar. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Dude, I can't make make sense as ornaments. <laughs> <laughs> Ask your question one more time. I kind of get it. <laughs> Alright, we won't belabor that. Um, this video goes on for quite a while. Uh, his buddies are standing around. Uh, they do finally uh, continue to ask him questions to see whether he's developing high altitude cerebral edema. Uh, but this is a case, uh, many of us don't get to see cases like this, but this is a case where he's advanced from that acute mountain sickness onto that high altitude cerebral edema. Moving from our AMS and our HAPE, we're gonna move into HAPE. And this is an early presentation of HAPE. So with mild HAPE, what it really looks like is the decrease uh, exercise performance, they have fatigue, dismay on exertion with cough. I would tell you that anybody that goes up to these altitudes, um, it's gonna be very difficult to assess uh, this is any different um, because anybody that goes to these altitudes are going to have those types of symptoms. They also can have cough um, related to the altitude itself. So some things to look for um, to try to identify this early, which can be very, very difficult to identify early, is look for those individuals that are outside of the normal group. So the other individuals in the, the group uh, that they're at sea level with and as they moved up, um, have they changed and are they different from those around them? Another thing that you can use is a, a pulse ox and assess them. Again, um, this is an adjunct um, to overall assessment of their condition, but seeing if they're 10% or more difference from the rest of the mountaineers that are with them. I'm not gonna belabor this. Um, you all are board certified uh, in a specialty, but bottom line is uh, high altitude pulmonary edema. What we're seeing is that fluid, fluid buildup within the alveoli. And we advance from that early stage uh, to that late presentation. And this is the individual that you see, whether it be in the ER, the critical care unit, wherever that happens to be, as they start to progress, uh, they get hypoxic and they start to have mental status changes. The next video that I will play, uh, this is a climber um, that uh, had difficulty getting off uh, the mountainside, uh, was treated uh, on the mountainside itself and then evacuated and I would say that um, at the time of evacuation, you'll get to see yourself that he has fairly minimal symptoms. Uh, neighbor, neighbor, morning. Copy, hope you have a good weather up there. At 21,000 feet, Jason attempts a rescue at the world's highest landing point, Mount Everest, Camp Two. Morning, Captain. This is Dima. Oh, I have Robert. Get the pills, Robert. Okay. Jason has been trying to rescue Robert K for 24 hours. Finally, the critically ill climber is on board. In all stations, uh, no, no, Julie, it's all people came through. Uh, Andrew, you on this one? <laughs> but Robert's not out of the woods yet. Fluid is rapidly filling his lungs, slowly drowning him. A condition known as HAPE, or high altitude pulmonary edema. Robert's survival depends on Jason. Okay, I have uh, Robert, and uh, we're going to look for the hospital. Okay, sir. Okay. He did say to me a couple of times that he thought he was a goner at Camp 4. All right, so again, I would consider that um, at that point in time, a mild case for that individual as we started to evacuate, but uh, the correct choice was made for him to descend. The first thing we're gonna talk about, so moving from identifying uh, these type of high altitude illnesses, we're gonna first talk about prophylaxis for high altitude illnesses. 
The first step is really advising our patients. So as we talk about in diving, uh, this is a non-pharmaceutical prophylaxis. And this is difficult to do because many uh, climbers uh, want to get, many mountaineers uh, want to get up um, you know, to the various different camps. Um, it's a challenge for them. They also have a limited amount of time and limited windows depending on the weather situation. So this can be difficult to advise climbers uh, to have a stage descent where they go up and they spend um, six to seven days at moderate altitude. One of those things that they can do as well uh, is the slow ascent where they climb a maximum of 2,000 feet per day above the 10,000 feet mark and they sleep two days at that level. This is very similar to you know the, the last bullet on there where they can go up to 2,000 feet above where they were the night before, but they go down 1,000 feet um, and they sleep uh, 1,000 feet above the previous night. So there's multiple different cl climbing strategies that are available. Uh, but the bottom line uh, that we need to know is, is that uh, slow, smooth, smooth is fast, uh, and you climb high and sleep low in this case. So moving from the non-pharmaceutical uh, to more of the pharmaceutical approach, which some of you are probably uh, likely familiar with, the top one with a is AMS only. Uh, that is not uh, high altitude cerebral edema, and you can see the grade of evidence uh, that is there for Motrin. What you wanna do if you're helping to dose these medications is start the day before ascent, uh, and you want your patient to continue these uh, two to three days after their maximal altitude. There was a Cochrane review done. Uh, there were 16 trials, 2,300 participants that demonstrated the reduction in AMS with the acetazolamide. The relative uh, risk for that was 0.47. There's a confidence interval of 95% um, between 0.39 uh, to 0.56. Acetazolamide, how's it work? It inhibits the carbonic anhydrase in the kidneys, uh, increasing the uh, biocarbonate uh, excretion in the urine. This uh, causes a metabolic acidosis, which offsets the re respiratory alkalosis that happens during uh, climbing or mountaineering. Um, a note uh, or a side note, one of the common side effects to acetazolamide is the risk of paresthesias uh, when they're taking the medication. So, this is something that you want to, uh, you know, counsel your patient on beforehand, and that way they can identify when they're taking their medications and allow uh, their individual, whoever their medical officer is, to know that they're one taking the medication and two uh, what their symptoms are, uh, and that way they know if that's consistent or something's changed uh, while they're climbing. Dexamethasone, on the other hand, uh, was shown in the Cochrane review uh, to uh, reduce the risk of AMS in two different studies. Relative risk was about 0.37 with a 95% confidence interval between 0.23 and 0.61. Um, the other thing that we look at is how this glucocorticoids really work. And they're known to work by uh, blocking the hypoxia-induced endothelial dysfunction, which alleviates the AMS symptoms. I want you to keep track of the dosing. I'll have a chart at the end. Uh, you'll note here that uh, for the prophylaxis piece, it's 125 milligrams POBIB, uh, and dexamethasone is four milligrams every uh, 12 hours. And that's going to change when we look at the treatment. So moving from uh, AMS and HACE uh, into prophylaxis for HAPE, uh, if uh, you don't have the extended release, uh, nifedipine can be utilized with the 10 milligrams orally or sublingual every four hours. Uh, you can see the dosing up there for nifedipine. Nifedipine and phosphodiesterases both reduce the pulmonary hypertension. How does nifedipine work? Uh, it, it disrupts the movement of calcium through the calcium channels, and it reduces that pulmonary vascular resistance, whereas the phosphodiesterases increase nitric oxide production. This attenuates the uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction during uh, acute hypoxia. The dosing here is going to remain consistent whether you're looking at um, your prophylaxis versus your treatment. So now moving into, we were out in the prophylaxis, we're moving now into the treatment of high altitude illnesses. So again, starting off with non-pharmaceutical treatments. Uh, the number one thing uh, for, you know, hate and haste is to immediately descend. Just two to 4,000 feet uh, descent 
can result in a significant improvement of their overall symptoms. However, um, despite the improvement of their symptoms, uh, you should continue to descend uh, until they receive definitive medical care. And as the individual is descending, they also need to be monitored by a healthcare provider and not just left alone through the continuum of care. AMS, on the other hand, um, if you have AMS, uh, some treatment strat strategies are either remain at the altitude in which you're at or descend uh, 500 meters. And at descent of 500 meters, uh, if they remain asymptomatic um, at 18 hours, then you can consider after treatment whether they can ascend again. Again, you really wanna assess these patients uh, and ensure that they, that they are not progressing into high altitude cerebral edema. If your patient is unable to descend, uh, there are multiple treatments that you could consider. Uh, one of those being oxygen supplementation with a goal of greater than 90% of O2 SAD. This is extremely difficult to get at altitudes because of uh, the equipment and uh, ability to be able to transport it to those levels. So I would say that likelihood is, is you're not gonna have a prolonged oxygen supply at altitude. There are uh, portable, as you can see on the right-hand side there, uh, hyperbaric bags that can be utilized in an uh, emergency. These can provide a physiologic descent uh, up to about 5,000 feet. Um, and you look back to where we talked about, um, you know, just with two to 4,000 feet uh, descent, they can have significant improvement of the symptoms. Many of these uh, bags have a, a window in them so you can monitor your patients. However, uh, if your patients have any kind of complications, as you're aware of, if you open that bag, again, uh, they're going back uh, to the atmospheric level in which you're at. And so they immediately uh, will likely revert or continue to have symptoms. Uh, so you want to continuously monitor them uh, in these bags and then um, only um, stop the treatment if you're able to descend. And it, it can be an ethical call depending on the situation, weather situation, difficulty uh, evacuating this patient. Uh, this is uh, a, a difficult treatment, a laborious treatment if you've ever uh, done it. It has a little pump there you can see uh, that has to be manually pumped to maintain that pressure. And so this can end in a difficult situation if you're unable to uh, descend. So going from non-pharmaceutical uh, treatment uh, to some considerations for pharmaceutical treatment. As I said before, um, these are the same dosing uh, for high altitude uh, pulmonary edema. And same thing uh, that I said about uh, the you know, potential of utilizing them uh, for prophylaxis, uh, you know, treatment. Oops, went the wrong way, there we go. So um, AMS and HACE, um, so AMS, in the case of a mild uh, case of AMS, uh, acetazolamide, you see the increase we talked about previously for the prophylaxis, we utilize 125 milligrams of POBID. Uh, in the case of treatment and mild cases, it's 250 milligrams uh, POBID. Dexamethasone, uh, two to four every six. And then when you look at moderate to severe or HACE, in the case of HACE, you want to uh, utilize a first dose of eight milligrams. And then as you do uh, additional dosing, you're going to go to four milligrams. If it's AMS and only AMS, uh, then you're going to do the four milligrams milligrams every six hours. I'm sorry, I went backwards on the previous one, but uh, this is the pharmaceutical treatment. Again, uh, exact same as we talked or we discussed before uh, for the prophylaxis, no change in dosing. So take home points right when we start out in the beginning, uh, whether it be diet medicine or it be altitude medicine, you wanna plan ahead. Uh, you wanna have a great uh, emergency action plan and you wanna have a multidisciplinary team uh, that assists with difficult cases. Uh, you also wanna have a multidisciplinary team when you think about planning uh, and planning the routes in which you're gonna to help to evacuate this patient. With altitude medicine, uh, if you can, and the weather allows and the situation allows, uh, the number one treatment is to descend. Uh, if all else fails, then packing wisely, uh, having the medications, we talked about uh, multiple different medications, uh, but. The common ones uh, you can see up there, the ones that are currently recommended for the prophylaxis and the treatment. 
uh, if possible, having emergency airway equipment uh, available, uh, having our, our bags available to be able to, uh, you know, pressurize patients at altitude. And again, oxygen is very difficult just given the logistics of it. But if you have oxygen available uh, and you can bring oxygen to altitude, that is another thing that can assist in these cases. Talked about a ton of medications. Again, I just wanted to lay them out in a chart uh, so you had them available and it is clearly laid out. Um, again, I'm not gonna belabor the point on what medications we talked through each one of these, uh, but each medication has a primary and alternate or each condition uh, has a primary and alternate uh, for prophylaxis or treatment of the conditions. And thank you. And if you want my references, Again, I have multiple references that are not only in the presentation, uh, but here in the end. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, I know I have learned something every time I've heard that presentation, so um, I really appreciate that. Uh, a question to start you off would be, how long after an acute respiratory illness, whether that's a URI, sinus infection, COVID infection, do, is the typical re recommendation to wait prior to um, any sort of diving activity? I'll tell you, uh, Julie, for the COVID infections, I would have to go back to uh, recently uh, BUMED. So uh, the Navy's medical department has put out some great guidance on post-COVID infection. And since they do a lot of dive instruction, I have to go back to their recommendation to be able to tell you exactly what uh, they're recommending. Because as you know, uh, with COVID, there can be different, uh, you know, severities of COVID themselves. And I think we want to be uh, absolutely certain uh, of where our patient is at before that. And how do we need to evaluate them? Because as we looked at the cardiac cases versus the pulmonary cases, which all those can be involved in our COVID patients. And we want to make sure that we have a multidisciplinary team especially with recreational diving. Uh, when we're looking at our recreational divers and they're doing this for fun, we don't want a fun event to turn into uh, a deadly event for them. So uh, I would have to go back and review uh, prior to uh, them, you know, making a recommendation on that um, based on BUMED's recommendation. They're the ones I'd rely on. Uh, now your other question as far as upper respiratory tract infections. One, I would uh, absolutely ensure that they're not febrile, um, they're afebrile, they're asymptomatic. Uh, my preference, again, I'm not sure there's a hard recommendation for that, uh, but my recommendation for them is one, uh, they've already, if we're looking at medications, they've been on medications, those medications uh, don't result in any type of mental status changes or the potential of that. Um, and a, a common medication used for divers would be Afrin uh, to help with eustachian tube dysfunction. I do not put my divers on Afrin just to have them dive. Um, so I would recommend that asymptomatic, afebrile, um, and at least uh, once they're on their medications, uh, you know, three to seven days post that. Yeah, the cardiac and pulmonary complications, in addition to the upper respiratory for COVID, would certainly muddy the water, um, pun intended. But um, another question I have would just be what recommendations of sources or um, I guess experiences would you have for interested fellows or providers to get experience treating um, or I guess just working with both dive and altitude medicine? Yeah, I think this is one of the hardest areas uh, to get experience with as a medical provider uh, because we have we have our chambers uh, and we're seeing them as you know many of us obviously on this call are sports medicine physicians and when we see them for their chamber uh, treatment they usually have already gone through the field side treatment uh, and then we're seeing them in the chamber. And I don't know if that's the best time to see our patients, uh, meaning we need the experience on that field side. Uh, we need that experience out on the actual event. And so I think really um, some of the best ways to get that is joining an experienced provider uh, on a, you know, whether it be a dive or a altitude uh, type of event and, and learning from an experienced provider in those cases, because outside the military, uh, it's very difficult uh, to find these scenarios where you're able to uh, learn on your own, uh, especially on the field side. So my recommendation would be look for that. I don't know of any specific classes uh, that, that will have an introduction 
uh, to that. I do know of multiple civilian classes that you can get experience running a, a chamber uh, for dive medicine. However, that's still not giving you that kind of field side uh, type of medicine. So I, I don't have a reference for the civilian uh, portion to be able to get out there besides finding someone that's doing it and shadowing them. Um, and then one final question that um, I would have would be in your pre-participation physical exam, when you do get the opportunity to kind of assess your team and beforehand, are there specific questions that or exam findings that you would um, either do or ask that would make you inclined to start someone on prophylactic medication um, prior to an altitude event? Yeah, uh, so I, I think that's a twofold question. Uh, one, uh, first of all, if they've had any prior event, meaning if they've had any prior high altitude illness, uh, you need to be uh, highly alert about that because they're gonna have a higher incidence of having a repeat high altitude illness. And so I, again, in those scenarios, uh, one, uh, that there's a high likelihood they should be on a, a prophylactic medication prior to um, going to these austere wilderness medicine type of activities. Uh, and two, uh, you should have them assess prior to doing that to make sure there's not something else going on that wasn't identified or underlying uh, for the reason why they had that. And so we have to look back to our special cases uh, that we talked about. And so are there other things going on? And I would go back to, as uh, you know, Dr. O'Connor has uh, taught many times, is, is that a very thorough assessment, one, questioning the patient about their history, uh, and two, what am I looking for on exam if we're talking about whether that be dive or altitude, I really want to identify any potential of the history or pulmonary or especially cardiac conditions, any type of neurological conditions that are already pre-existing or anything in the history that would allude to those types of conditions. We want to be, um, we want to identify those early because that could help us, again, you know, counsel our patient risk benefits. Also, it can make us well aware of what they already had before we get to the dive side or the mountain side uh, and ensure that we know what has changed. Perfect. Well, seeing no other questions, um, I will just thank you so much for your time. Um, and again, a wonderful lecture. Um, and so we greatly appreciate it. Um, and otherwise, um, well, I'll send you off. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Julie. Thank you all uh, for listening.